happy sabbath we welcome you all for the sabbath school to begin our song service let's sing few songs for the first song we'll sing hymn number 34 wake the song Next song let's sing 633 when we all get to heaven hymn number 633 
Next song will sing hymn number 470, There's Sunshine in My Soul. Good morning, everyone. Let's turn our Bibles to Joshua 1.9. Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. With these few words, I would like to welcome you all for this online Sabbath school service. To begin, let's all bow our heads and pray. Let's pray. Our most loving and living Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful morning, O Lord. Thank you for giving us good night's sleep, O Lord. Thank you for taking care of us from past time, O Father. Lord, thank you for keeping us safe in this pandemic time, O Father. Lord, we submit and surrender ourselves into your guide and care, O Father. Lord, I put this program in your hands, O Father. May people be blessed with this program, O oh Father. Be with all the sick and the suffering, O oh Lord, who are affected by the virus, O oh Father. Touch them and heal them, O oh Lord. Thank you for hearing our prayers. All glory and honor be unto your name. For us, this few blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. The mother of Maria, she was trying to convince Maria to renounce her faith or to renounce Jesus. She has tried many times, but she failed. And one day, the family was at the restaurant, spending some time. But the mother, and along with her younger sister, slipped a sleeping pill into Maria's drink. After, few ta after some times, Maria was unconscious, and they took her 
to the car and they drove back to their home into their village and the mother of Maria had a plan and she hired a Nigerian witch doctor to come and change the mind of Maria to renounce Jesus but after the Maria saw the witch doctor she told even if you kill me I will not deny Jesus and the doctor smiled the witch doctor smiled grimly and she told and uh, the doctor said your mother had told me that she tried many times to kill you but she has failed but I have something more powerful than your Jesus so he makes a strange drink with water and he gave them uh, to Maria to drink but even that didn't work out Maria said I will not deny Jesus and I will worship him here even if I don't go to church because Jesus is everywhere so her, one day her mother helped the witch doctor to put a, a, a lotion on Maria's body and her face her whole body was painting she had some body ache and Maria also had a son and he was five years old his name is Mark he was not understanding what's what was going on with her mother but after he saw the the face of her her of his mother he, he wept and we remember his mother used to pray with him before going to bed so he went and asked Maria's younger sister if they could pray together and they prayed to Jesus to help her or to heal Maria but after seven months Maria was becoming more weak she was unable to move and uh, her sister they called he she called she called uh, Maria's friend from the church and she was telling if they could pray for that for Maria recovery and they were talking and Maria's friend asked her like if he could speak to Maria but the younger sister said she is unable to even move and she just snapped the photo of Maria and when she sent to to that friend he wept as well and she asked if she uh, if Maria's younger sister can could help them or Maria to escape but she told she's going to try one day the mother was having a meeting a business meeting so she left the house as well the witch doctor by chance he went some somewhere else and there was a watchman but the younger sister sent him to buy something at the at the shop so the the maria's friend he sent a driver just to pick up maria and take her to along with her with her son to the capital so they the plan they could take they could take uh they were able to take maria to the capital but the witch doctor he transformed himself into a snake a big snake around one meter long and as soon as maria got uh got into the church at the capital the elders of the church were praying for her and they anointed maria and Maria was resting in, uh, in a guest room so the witch doctor who transformed himself into a big snake he was trying to get inside the Maria's 
uh, the place where Maria was resting into the hole. But the member, one of the members noticed it and he called everyone. They were trying to kill the snake. So they were able to kill the snake. And after some times, Maria re received a call, but she wasn't picking. Her phone was kept on ringing. One of the members said, it might be something important because they are calling you every time. So could you pick the call? Maria uh, picked the call and it was her sister, her younger sister. And she was telling her like, could, could you hear the ambulance? And she was worried and she was perplexed as well. She asked like, did something wrong happen to our mother? She said, not the mother, but that witch doctor. He fell from the second floor of, of our house and he is dead. And also the young sister told, you'll be well now. After one or two days, Maria was recovered from her injuries and all the suffering. Right now, Maria and her son, Mark, they are hidden because her mother still want to kill them. He's trying to kill them. But even uh, to this trial, she remained faithful. And she has a dream that one day, uh, her people will become Christian and she will be able to share the message of Christ to everyone. And I hope that this story may inspire each one of us and whatever light you have, may you share with us. Happy Sabbath Church. For today's feature talk, I'm going to talk about a few interesting facts about a very peculiar, common, yet unique and a well-known bird. Mm -hmm. This bird's name itself describes what it does. It hums. So if you've not guessed it already, I speak about the hummingbird today. I'm going to share a few facts about this bird, starting with a fact which many of us would be knowing. This is the smallest bird in the bird species. Yes, hummingbird is the smallest bird of the bird species which weighs just 1.95 grams. You would wonder how much that would be. Imagine one fourth teaspoon of sugar. And I think it would also fit in the palm. Right? So it is the smallest bird that there is. Right? You might assume that this tiny little bird might be eating very little. But no, that's my second fact for you. These birds eat a lot. They eat a lot and the facts that I'm going to tell you are going to amaze you. You see, hummingbirds have very high metabolism. Okay? They must eat all day long just to survive. So we do say, right, that do you eat to live or live to eat? I think hummingbirds eat to live. So they eat just to survive. They consume about half their body weight in bugs and nectar, feeding every 10 to 15 minutes and visiting around 1000 to 2000 flowers every day. So imagine how much they eat. Okay. In addition to the nectar from flowers and feeders, these birds eat small insects, beetles, ants and mosquitoes. You must be wondering, they would be good to have in your backyard, right? Yes. See how extraordinary they are. They are tiny birds, but they eat all day long. Another fact that I would like to share about the hummingbirds is that they travel. Can you imagine this tiny little bird, which might be just little bigger than a butterfly, you can say. They travel. They migrate. They migrate from one place to another. Okay. And the interesting fact is that they migrate 2000 miles a year. Right. And before they start their migration, they gain around 25% to 40% of their body weight. So I think they eat even more. And 
then they start their migration. And unlike other birds which fly in flocks, these birds, they migrate solo, they travel solo. So, so far we've covered three facts, that they are the smallest birds and they eat a lot despite being the smallest and they travel, right? But there is one more fact, which is with respect to traveling, not only do they travel and migrate, they fly fancy. Yes, they fly fancy. There is no other bird which flies like the hummingbird. They can fly in all kinds of ways. They fly forward, they fly backward, they even fly upside down. Right? Can you imagine? If you want, you can see some videos of the hummingbirds which fly in different ways. Right? And it is a pretty sight to see. Not only do they fly fancy, they fly really fast. Okay? They have they are fast, they are agile, they have speed, they have stamina. So this is like a super bird, right? Which flies in different ways, which travels solo and it is fast and agile, right? But along with just the physical attributes that we talked about, we can definitely call these birds as the big brained birds. I'll tell you why. Unlike the other birds, hummingbirds brain make up to 4.2% of their weight. This is not usually the case with other birds, right? So their brain is uh, more, has more quantity, right? And not only that, studies have shown that hummingbirds can remember the migration routes that they've taken in their lives. And they remember every flower they, that they've ever visited. Okay, they can also figure out how long it takes for the generation of nectar in the flowers for them to visit them again. Interesting, isn't it? There is one more interesting fact that the study shows that they can recognize humans. So if you ever want to have a pet or if you visit, see a hummingbird, know that they know you too. Isn't it amazing that these tiny, small or rather smallest bird has so many facts which make it different than the rest of the birds. Makes me, it reminds me of a song, right? All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small. All things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. So, just to bring to your notice that this tiny bird is an example of how Jesus has created and not only created but is sustaining even the tiniest bird that is in the world, right? From the tiniest to the greatest, all that is in the world is created and is being sustained by Jesus. So with these facts about the hummingbird, I would like to leave you with thought that if our God has created the smallest bird with so much perfection, imagine what he could do and is doing with the crowning work of his creation, that is you and I.
morning, my dear beloved in Jesus Christ. I'm sure that we all have come to get a blessing from the Lord, and I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome each one of you all around our regular church members and those who are watching and listening as we open the word of the Lord and the wonderful message that it has for us. Let's just bow our heads for a moment. A God in heaven, as we open the book of Philippians and the other ones attached to it, we pray that your Holy Spirit would give us the insight that we need to be worthy witnesses for you and to be ambassadors to bring in those who are lost because that is the ultimate of heaven and you who have come here and died for us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. We have been studying this whole quarter making friends for God. And today our lesson is entitled A Step in Faith. We both Pastor and Mrs. Shinge have segregated the entire lesson. I would be taking care of the introduction, the memory verse, the Sunday portion, and go down a touch on the Monday portion, then I'd move to the Tuesday portion, again go down take care of the Wednesday portion, and then we both will wind up with the Thursday at the conclusion. Moving quickly, the memory was found in Philippians, the second chapter, verses 5 to 7. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ. To break it up, to try to understand, Paul is helping us to understand what he has written to the Philippians in his letter. Let this mind be is a need for unity and unselfish humility, a complete provision for the mind of Jesus. In you or among you is Savior's divine and human nature, all spiritual life centers in Christ. Lessons of unity and humility are found in the life of Christ. The entire career of Christ as a supreme explication of the virtues the Philippians were to receive. Paul is not dealing with theology as academics. He is referring to the understanding of Christ's redemptive work. Christ left His expressible glory and took upon Himself the most humble form of humanity and preferred the most lowly offices just because man could be saved. The next word being to begin or to be existence and in the memory text the word form denotes all the characteristics and attributes of God even though Christ took the human form he is equal 
with God. And far above any other power, Paul stresses this in order to portray more vividly the depth of Christ's voluntary humility. The next verse in the, th in the text, thought. Paul again was trying to enable the Philippians to emulate to that mind that Christ equal to God he decided to forego the glory associated with that exalted state in order to accomplish his compassionate purpose of saving lost mankind. The word robbery in the text a seizing something to be grasped a prize to snatch away comes from the Greek word hapagmas I just may have mispronounced it, I'm sorry. The next phrase in the text is to be equal. Continue to exist in equality with God, but Christ willing to relinquish it in the interest of man's salvation. The phrase again made himself of no reputation, literally emptied himself on all the tokens of divine divinity or else he could not accomplish incarnation, took himself the form of a servant. During the Roman era, Servants were actually slaves. They were to serve without question and they were obedient to their masters. As Christ was to God and also Paul was to God. Romans 1.1 1, 1. How can all this be accomplished is beyond human comprehension. It is part of the great mystery of godliness. 1 Timothy 3.16 When we share in the true spirit of Christ, when He dwells within us and will live the life of Christ, we will then be like Christ. Thus, Paul's admonition is the early verses. The next phrase, and was made, having become contrast with being in verse 6. The next word, likeness, a resemblance. In all things, it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren. Hebrews 2.17 He was a complete man, yet he was also divine. When men saw him, they saw him just like them. He should not doubt we should not doubt his deity. He was not completely man if his divinity in the least degree qualified his humanity. He then practically eases to be an example to us of a human being, just a substitute. Men it's a plural form to represent the entire human race and not just one person. 
the next phrase being found they discard his human fashion which emphasizes all outward appearances of Christ was of a man the next phrase as a man Jesus of Nazareth he had made man's outward form yet he was God as well as man humbled and became obedient even unto death the voluntary humiliation is shown on the cross and obedient only to God our belief in the deity of Christ must not weaken in any way our belief in his complete human if he was not absolutely a man if his divinity in the least degree qualified his humanity then he practically ceases to be an example as i have again mentioned this previously the next portion will be taken by roda shinge the monday's portion oh, it's a great honor and privilege for us to take this lesson study i think after a gap of uh, two and a half years so <laughs> we got back so this morning uh, since i'm uh, touching on monday i will not repeat so if you keep your bibles open i'm uh, going to the book of matthew 4 18 to 20 and jesus walking by the sea of galilee saw two brethren simon called peter and andrew his brother casting a net into the sea for they were fishers and he said unto them follow me and i will make you fishers of men and they straight away left the nets and followed him in the sense of becoming a full time disciple henceforth peter and andrew were to make their full time business to be learners in the school of jesus the master fisherman this very moment was catching peter andrew James and John and the miracle was his net it is purposed in catching these four men alive and they they were catching fish which were dead but now Jesus told them that they would be catching men alive it was uh, prophesied long back in Jeremiah 16:16 16, you can refer and spoken in the similar language and now these four men peter andrew james and john were now caught in the gospel net there was no escape in fact there was no desire to escape as we were uh, preparing we uh, we came across a lot of uh, points so i might not get into too much but what i understood these four partners were in possession of the largest cache of fish we understand that particular night you remember and then jesus says okay the largest haul they had was about 153 it was a miracle in front of the rice and then they had to at that moment decide to abandon their business and imagine they had to really follow as it's quoted in volume 5 an itinerant teacher who up to this time had appeared they had very small success but in the provision of the abundance of fish jesus gave evidence of his power to provide for the needs of his followers and in humble faith they believed and so beautifully when you read all about the call of the different uh, men who were fishermen it's so beautifully brought out they just got up and followed uh matthew 99 call of matthew the tax collector and as jesus passed forth from thence he saw a man named matthew sitting at the receipt of custom and he said unto him follow me and he arose and followed him i was doing a little more A research on this the receipt of custom and that is the tax office it apparently was by the seaside and was probably an office at which herod antipas collected revenue from caravans and travelers passing along the main highway from damascus 
and the east to Ptolemy, on the Mediterranean or over the Lake of Galilee from the territory of Herod Philip. Now in popular opinion, tax collectors were considered disreputable. Not only were they frequently agents of Roman oppression, they were also extortioners on their own accounts who made use of their official power to oppress and defraud the people. So obviously, Matthew did not have a very good name. They were hated, despised by all, as social and religious outcasts. And when the Lord extended the invitation to Matthew, what does it say in the verse? He arose. Matthew was ready, it says. Such a decision would presuppose his having his heart. Poor man, he could not believe that the Lord had given him a call, that the rabbi had condescended to make him one of his disciples. And please note it says, and Matthew left all. Mind you, a very successful businessman, a very, very rich man, he leaves and left all in order to follow Jesus. And it says, he left a profitable business to serve without pay. The commitment that these men have showed is amazing. And Jesus had, in Matthew 8.21, there was another disciple who was told to follow. And he started uh, giving the excuse of, I need to bury my father. Jesus moved ahead. He said, let the bury take care of the, let the dead take care of the dead. And uh, we see that these men followed and we understand the commitment better in this story of Uriah which comes down from the Old Testament when King David was in his palace and the soldiers were at war Uriah was called to give an account of what was happening there but David had not called Uriah for that we all know the sin that King David was involved in with Bathsheba she was carrying his child and he wanted Uriah to just go home and spend a couple of days for the cover up. But as it was, Uriah, when he came and gave the report and all that, suddenly in the night, David noticed something. He noticed Uriah at the gate with the servants. And he calls and asks him, why didn't you go home? And King David could see the home. That's how he got into the trouble. And uh, now here is the answer Uriah says, gives, he says, my Lord, the ark of God and my Lord's commander, Joab, they are out at war, they are staying in tents. How can I enjoy a meal and be with my wife? What total commitment. Just look at the way I think King David must have been terribly ashamed. He may not have voiced out, I don't remember exactly, but the beautiful answer, God's kingdom, the priority, Uriah made. You know, sometimes wives and families, it said, don't understand the priority of a minister. They might grumble, they may not understand. But only when you go into the depths of these kind of men, do you realize what is involved. So let us pray as these are the last days and we prepare for his coming. Moving to the Tuesday portion <clears throat> entitled God's Chosen Vessel. May I please recommend that later you can go through the Acts of the Apostles pages 112 to 118. Acts of the Apostles, pages 112 to 118. Prominent among the Jewish leaders who became thoroughly aroused by the success attending the proclamation of the gospel was Saul of Tarsus, a Roman citizen, a Jew by descent, educated in Jerusalem by the most eminent of rabbis, was a member of the Sanhedrin council, very powerful, 
took a prominent role in the conviction of the death of Stephen the martyr. And this incident is very important in the religious history of the world. The priests and rulers convinced him that Stephen was an imposter and the disciples were wrong. Saul concluded that the Pharisees were right and against the voice of his conscience and grace of God decided to persecute the Christians to such an extent to drag them even unto death, men, women and children. Due to the severe persecution, the Christians were leaving Jerusalem and establishing churches elsewhere. One of these places was Damascus. Saul took a letter of persecuting Christians from the high priest in Jerusalem and then proceeded to Damascus. We are all aware of what happened on that road. The bright lights, Paul becoming blind, a voice from above. Eventually, Saul asked God, What do you want me to do? God only answered and said, Reach Damascus and you will be told what to do. He did not disclose anything else to Saul. For three days he was in the house of Judah without sight, without food and water and was fasting. <clears throat> These days of close self-examination and of Heart humiliation was spent in lonely seclusions. While Saul was in solitude at the house of Judas, continuing prayer and supplication, the Lord appeared to Ananias and told him to go to the house of Judah and baptize Saul, who is in prayer and in need of help. <clears throat> Imagine Ananias' reaction. God, he is a persecutor with the authority from the high priest in Jerusalem. In our days we could call him the Don, a hitman. God said, just do as I tell you. Ananias was obedient and went and baptized Saul. With the same zeal to persecute, Saul became Paul and witnessed for God to the fury of the high priest and his associates at the temple in Jerusalem. Paul is one of the most loved and admired apostles mentioned in the Bible. His messages to the Romans, Corinthians and Philippians are my favorite. The chapters of Acts 26, 27 and 28 are the most powerful ones about Paul's history. Paul's encounter with King Agrippa, the journey to Jerusalem and the shipwreck speak of his total commitment to God's call. Acts 28, 30, 31 towards the end of his ministry while he was in prison in Rome, house arrested, he stayed in a rented home, rented house and received all who came and preached to them as recorded 
in the last two verses of the chapter of 28. A letter to the Philippians was written by Paul. It is addressed to the Christians at Philippi, a city of Macedonia. Paul being the author comes from his own reference to his imprisonment. The early church accepted this fact and in the middle second century the testimony comes from Polycarp, a Christian leader and a martyr. The historical setting of the Philippian church. The letter was written during the Paul's first imprisonment, ten years before he had proceeded to Philippi at Troas on the northwest east coast of Asia Minor around AD 50. Paul received a vision of a man from Macedonia pleading with him to come over and help them. Paul, Silas, Timothy and Luke responded immediately, went to Philippi, the first place in Europe where the gospel was preached. They came across Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira. Lydia and her husband readily accepted the message. In the record, it talks about the slave girl who was demon possessed, kept saying, Paul and Silas are servants of the Most High. When Paul cast off the spirit from her, her former masters stirred up a mob and had Paul and Silas beaten and cast into prison. We know the story of the earthquake that took place and the conversion of the jailer during the third missionary journey Paul stopped at Philippi and it was the time of Passover. Paul may have enjoyed the period of peaceful and happy communion thus offered him with those who were among the most loving and true-hearted of all his converts. The immediate occasion for the writing of the letter to the Philippians was because of a leader known as Apaproditus. He was a leader sent by the church at Philippians to Paul in Rome when he was ill and imprisoned. They sent him with a lot of gifts. They sent him to take care of Paul during his illness. And while he was returning back to Philippi, Paul decided to write this letter to the church at Philippi, to the Philippians. The theme of the letter is from a friend to friends. And Paul talks about 
the wonderful times that he has spent. He talks about asking them to be faithful. He encourages them. And in this letter, he keeps on talking about witnessing for the Lord and reminding them that it is possible if Christ is in you and if you are in Christ that your mind can be the mind of Christ. This is the crux of the entire letter to the Philippians. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ. May that be the prayer of each one of us. Okay, now moving on to the Wednesday portion, Demands of Love. Uh, it's taken from John 21, 15 to 19. It says, when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Now 16, 17, he said the second time, the third time. But I want to concentrate now on the 18th verse. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, walkest whither thou wast. When thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. Thus Jesus had made known to the disciple the very manner of his death, and even foretold. When I was reading in this Acts of the Apostles, Jesus so directly has mentioned to Peter how he would be martyred for his name's sake. And then was Peter willing to take up the cross? We all know what has happened. After his reinstatement, after his denial of Christ, Peter had unflinchingly braved danger and had shown a noble courage in preaching a crucified, risen and ascended Saviour. And now as he lay in the cell, the time had come. He was sentenced by Emperor Nero. He called to his mind the works that Christ had spoken to him, verily, verily. And Peter felt so sick about the denial, even after so many years. And to die as the Master died was too great an honor, please note that. He, even in death, he didn't want that kind of a death. He repeated and was forgiven by Christ. He fed the lambs, but he could never forgive himself. Not even the thought of the agonies of the last terrible scene could lessen the bitterness, it says, of his sorrow and repentance. And as a last favor, he entrusted, he entreated his executioners that he might be nailed to the cross with his head downward. And we all know about it. The request was granted and in the same manner died the great apostle Peter. Now sometimes uh, we may not uh, get into the details in the lesson, but when you get into the books, you will notice how much work these apostles have done, right from uh, the Pentecostal experience. So while I read this and I came to the next portion, I have uh, Thursday also, which I am going to wind up. and. Uh, there's a question that is asked down there, like, Peter, have you denied the Lord? If so, what is the story, not only of Peter's denial, but of Christ's words to Peter here, say to you. That is for each of us to contemplate. And Thursday's portion, it's talking about love's commitment. It's talking about the great beloved of Jesus, that is John. Now John has very graphically brought out everything that he has perceived, heard and seen. It said the way he has described 
is amazing. First John three sixteen to eighteen. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. Now this is what John is quoting. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And see how beautiful he has brought out. But whoso hath world's good, and seeth his brother, have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion. From him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? It's so simply brought out. And he says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. What is he trying to say? What we understood is after the disciples had witnessed the sufferings of Christ, after his crucifixion and resurrection and ascension to heaven, the Holy Spirit coming on them, on Pente Pentecostal, they had a clearer conception of the love of God and the nature of love with which they must treat and love one another. And in simple words, John is trying to say, there are those who do kind deeds without feeling real affection for those whom they are helping. They may be acting only from a sense of duty and a desire to gain the praise of men. Therefore, John is stressing the need for genuine love. Our loving deeds should be inspired, it says, by a genuine affection for others, particularly for those in need. John 13, 17 says, Jesus so aptly put, If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Now in the closing scene, I'd like to just quote from the Acts of the Apostles, page 558. John and Judas are representatives of those who profess to be Christ's followers. Both these disciples had the same opportunities to study and follow the divine pattern. Both were closely associated with Jesus and were privileged to listen to his teaching. Each possessed serious defects of character. Each had access to the divine grace that transforms character. But while one in humility was learning of Jesus, the other revealed that he was not a doer of the word, but a hearer only. One daily dying to self and overcoming sin was sanctified through the truth, the other resisting the transforming power of grace and indulging selfish desires was brought into bondage to Satan. As we spend time reading about these apostles, I'm sure there's so much that we can gain. So many truths have come home and I'm sure as we share with our families, we'll be blessed. Before I close down, I just wanted to share just two minutes. During this lockdown, I know we were all terribly uh, mortified, scared, you can just name it. And the seven months were terrible. But what I want to share this morning is, though there were things that were happening around us, Psalm 91 was very much prominent in my mind. Thousand on one side, ten thousand on the other side falling. Fresh vegetables and fruits from the farm used to be at our doorstep. The Lord never left his children. I'm sure each of us will have such things to testify. And I still remember when Nita had told me to take a future <coughs> talk, I said I will definitely take. And I was trying to read. My left eye was giving a little problem. I couldn't read. I was supposed to undergo a surgery. Somehow I managed to uh, get through those uh, things and I shared whatever stories I had. And I went through the surgery. It was after the future talk, I think, and uh, June 26th, if I remember. During the lockdown, going up and down to the doctors to get my other fitness things done, I can see the hand of the Lord. My dear friends, this is a testimony I want to share. You might be discouraged, you may be down, you may have, but when you go to the Lord, that faith that keeps you going is amazing.
So I want to say to all of you, there are all kinds of things which we are going to come about, you know, face all kinds of challenges. And my daughter just said the other day, you know, she had a problem, my older one. There was an earthquake and naturally we as parents get worried. So she will never tell that particular day. Next day, slowly she'll say, oh, there was an earthquake and this and that. And my grandson is very, very frank, Joshua. So I called him and asked him, I said, what happened? He said, uh, Nani, I was at school, Daddy was at office. And uh, there was this earthquake and uh, Eva, the little one was eating, it was lunchtime. And Mama just noticed and Eva started screaming, the ground is moving. They just ran down and he said, they reached the ground and it was still shaking and both fell down. This my daughter never told. My friends, as parents, we definitely feel because our children are so far away, they're working there. And she says, Mama, the Lord is there. So what I want to assure you, there are times you might be, you know, really troubled. Satan is trying all his best to sift. My son went through a DVT program. He has come out. I want to thank Dr. Jonas who was there attending on him, Dr. David. But above all, the Lord is supreme. Prayers have gone up and today I'm very privileged that I could share this thought with you and never ever get discouraged. Look up to him and reach out. He's just waiting for us. Thank you. May the Lord bless you all as we carry on with our witnessing.